Welcome to the Calvary Room with Pastor Sam Allen. God asked him a question. Have you considered my servant Job? And God does some boasting on Job. And, uh, and it's true for all of you. God boasts and brags about us. We're supposed to boast in him, of course. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. But let God do the boasting about us and, and how we bless him and please him. On today's walk down the Calvary Road, we press on through the scriptures in our study, Now Searching for the Lord in the Book of Job. Pastor Sam has entitled this study, The Truth About Sin and Suffering. This is the first of the five books of poetry here in the Old Testament. We've looked at the 17 books of history. We'll look at the five books of poetry, then we'll look at 17 books of prophecy. And you probably noted or you're wondering why they call it poetry when there's no rhyme or meter. It's because not all poetry is the poetry we're accustomed to. I love the worship we do. It's very poetic. There's always rhyme. There's meter. There's, there's a beautiful foundation that just blossoms as the songs continue Great writers writing great songs for the Lord in this generation. Well, Hebrew poetry is more about, well, repetition and parallelism and contrast and comparisons. And so sometimes you'll recognize it as such. Other times it's just going to be like, well, it's what it is. The first couple chapters, we will be introduced to a couple people we know well, Job and Satan. I hope you know, you know, Job better than Satan, but then God, who will we know best of all? And then we're going to look in chapters 3 through 37. It's some dialogue between Job's friends, who start out to be that, end up being judges. He calls them at one point miserable count, counselors, uh, you know, horrible physicians. And then in chapters 38 through 42, God will question Job. There'll be a rebuke for him and for all his friends. Then he'll restore Job. And well, the book ends as it begins with Job exceedingly blessed. Now, the age abiding principle that we're going to be tracking with as we go through this passage is that everyone sins and sin always leads to suffering. Sometimes suffering leads to sin. But we all sin, and sin always causes suffering. But our suffering is not always the result of our own sin. Such was the case with Job. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him, and his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. He'd rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. He's described for us, and I can summarize it with three R's. That's pirate stuff, right? Righteous rich and reverent. That's Job. Righteous in God's estimation. We'll see it. A blameless, not a sinless, but a blameless man. Incredibly rich, the richest man of his day. And then reverent. He has a heart for God. He has a heart for family. In spite of his great wealth, what he cares most about, and it's clear in the passage, is his family and their well-being and their welfare. Well, Verse 6, we get to, well, the, the conflict. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. 
And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. I jotted down, could he say that of me today? Would he say that of you today? That we're blameless and upright, none like us, that, that we fear God and shun evil. And I would hope the answer would be yes. If the answer is no, well, we can change that by simply saying, God, forgive me for putting that before you or, or worrying about this when you're in control or, or asking the oh so oft question, why, 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 why me and why now? And, and Lord, well, anyway, we continue. It's important to note Satan appears here with the other sons of God. It's, it's a title sometimes ascribed to the angels. We know Jesus is the only begotten son of God, uniquely begotten because he pre-existed his birth there in Bethlehem. We are sons and daughters of God, children of God, by the new birth and by adoption into the family of God. But here and elsewhere, he'll call the angels sons of God. He created them. They were his. They were for him. They worshiped him. And Satan shows up with the others. Now, he's not a force. He's not the force. He's not an expression of evil. He is a fallen angel who rebelled against God. And we looked at it recently, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Those are the two passages that describe the fall of Satan. And now, well, we're certainly beyond the fall and the angels are appearing before God and Satan, this fallen angel shows up and, uh, God asked him a question, have you considered my servant Job? And God does some boasting on Job. I'd like to think that he does this, you know, with us too, that he's like, hey, you see Nick down there? He's awesome. You know, he has your picture in his wallet. And, uh, and it's true for all of you. God boasts and brags about us. We're supposed to boast in him, of course. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. But let God do the boasting about us and, and how we bless him and please him and, and, and what he sees in us. Well, that word considered is important. It's a military term that means to examine a city or a wall, to look for a point of attack or weakness. He says, in essence, Satan, have you been strategizing against my servant Job? Well, Satan has been watching and he's been waiting and there will be opportunity for him to tempt and this liar and father of lies answers the Lord. And listen, Satan doesn't always lie. He's capable of telling the truth. More often than not, he'll use a little bit of truth to sort of draw people in and then he just starts to stretch and twist to what he ends up with. Doesn't even resemble the truth at all. Well, in verse nine, he answers the Lord and says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the liar and father of lies, the slanderer tells God, since he can't deny Job's devotion, he simply questions his motivation. He's saying, Job just worships you because you're so good to him. And let me say, there's an element of truth in that. We love him because he first loved us. We serve because, well, he served and gave his life a ransom for us. And so we are always responding to God. And the fact that he's good means, well, we should be responding in a positive and, and affirming and, and thankful and, and, you know, loving way. So what he's saying, though, is Job only worships you. 
because you've so blessed him. And God's going to prove Satan wrong because God knows the truth about Job. And so as he continues on, what is, he goes on to say, you know, stretch out your hand, verse 11, we read it, touch all he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Well, that's not going to happen. And God knows that's not going to happen, but he takes Satan up on all of this. And in the midst of the trial that follows, I want you to see a couple things. God will allow Job to be sifted. God will allow us to be sifted, to be tried, to be tempted, to be tested. That's why I think Jesus taught us to pray, lead me not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But he does allow sifting. In the midst of it, he sets limitations. It's so important. God is sovereign and always in control. He tells Peter at one point, Satan's desired to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. I bet Peter was thinking, thanks, Lord. That's good because then he won't be able to do it. And then he says, and when you've been restored, strengthen your brethren. What? Wait, he's after me. You're praying for me, but he's going to get me? No, he's just going to sift you. And what he's saying is that process will make you stronger and better in the ministry that I've prepared for you and I'm preparing you for. Well, as we go through this then, and we're not going to read all of it, important to see throughout the sovereignty of God. Satan can't do anything God doesn't allow. Jesus explained that to Pilate when Pilate says, don't you know I have power to crucify you and power to, to let you go? And he said, you'd have no power over me unless it were given you from above. Once we settle that issue, we can stop wondering why God allows this or how God, you know, how come God let that happen? We're not going to get an answer for that, but we can know he's in control, that Romans 8, 28 is true. All things are working together because we're called according to his purpose. He loves us. He's planned good things for us and all things include those things we wish would never, ever happen. Well, as we look at then this, then um, Job's suffering, it turns out, will be the result of his faithfulness to God and Satan's hatred for God and for those who are faithful to God. The attack is swift and brutal. It's radical that he loses his servants, his family is killed, all he owns is either stolen or destroyed. And his response to all this, and I said we'd be reading some, we have to read some of this because it's too important. When you hear it and you see it, it's going to be etched permanently within you. Look at chapter one, verse 20. After he lost everything and everyone except his wife, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. And the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. He said, I came in with nothing. I'll go out with nothing. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And for the first time, and he'll say it again of Job, verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Well, the second accusation is there in chapter two, and it's simple. He says, look, you've hedged him in. You've protected him. And, and well, you take that away. You let me at him. Let me get them and let him suffer physically. And again, he makes the same claim. He'll curse you to your face. The hedge is removed. The limitations remain. You can touch him, but you can't kill him, God says. And the suffering begins. In verse 9, seeing her husband in such despair, 
And he's described for us as just oozing with open wounds and maggots in him. And he's covering himself with dust to try to get some relief. He suffered more greatly than anybody I've ever known. And I've seen some people go through some really hard stuff physically and otherwise. It's so bad that at one point in verse nine, chapter two, take a look. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. His response to her is amazing in light of all he's endured so far. And the book's just getting started. He says, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, chapter three, Job will ask one of life's most common questions. And that question is why? His friends show up and by the way, though he'll later call them worthless physicians and, you know, miserable comforters, they were actual friends. If you've read through it, you know people who Job had been a blessing to were cursing him and mocking him and spitting in his face. And and here's a man who, when others suffered, he did all he could to alleviate that suffering. When they were hungry, he fed them. When they were were, were in need of clothing, he clothed them. He was somebody who cared for people. And now some of those very same people are just mocking him and spitting on him and despising him. And we're going to get to see why. And it's going to come down to things they believed about him that just weren't true. Well, these, his friends, were the only ones who came. They sat in silence for a week. And I want to say, having been with many people who suffered unthinkable loss and having been through it in our family, I want to say that sitting with someone in silence, weeping with those who weep, it can be a great comfort. And as much as we want to say, well, you know, and in the end, and well, they knew the Lord and all things work together. There's a time for that. But the time when someone's in such great grief is a time to just sit and weep with them. Weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, for seven days, these friends comforted Job with their presence and their tears And I'm certain their prayers. Now, Job's lament in chapter three, before we look at things going south with the friends, is important. He doesn't curse God. He'll never do that. But he does curse the day he was born. And four times he asked the same question. Why? Look at, it's chapter three, verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep and I would have at least been at rest. Well, he has otherwise, but they're related to, wouldn't it have been better if I never lived than to live in this state? And I want to say, because I've read the whole book, At the end, he's not saying why, except for why are you so good to me? And and though he's never read Romans 8, 28, he's lived the reality of all things, even the worst things, working together for good. Well, chapters 4 through 37, we have three series of responses. Starts with three guys, and then a fourth is added as he subs in for the third of the three, He's the youngest and he's been around and quiet and listening. And finally, he's like, I can't take any more of this. That guy doesn't know anything. You guys are both blowing it. Let me tell you what I think. And it's important to say when God rebukes Job, as he will, and the three miserable counselors, as he does, he never rebukes the fourth guy. I love that. He's the youngest and he's the wisest as we're going to see. Well, first guy up, uh, Eliphaz or Eliphaz has uh, a problem with Job based on a presupposition. 
It's this simply, only the guilty suffer. You're suffering seriously, so you are guilty. That's sort of summarizing his whole position. Only the guilty suffer. You're suffering seriously, so you're not guilty. Or so you're guilty, excuse me. Well, listen, he's wrong about the first. The guilty do suffer, but everyone suffers. And, um, you know, you're seriously suffering. Oh, he's right about that. So you're guilty. No, he's wrong there too. Look at verse 7 of chapter 4. Remember now, he says to Job, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I've seen, because he's citing, hey, you know, I'm, I'm an observer of nature and human nature and history. I've seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God, they perish, and by the breath of his anger, they are consumed. Let me say, if you didn't read through it, you should. And if you did read through it, it's important to note that even when they're getting it wrong, they get some things right. It's not that these guys don't know anything. They just don't know what's actually happening and why. So when they say, or when he says, as I've seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same, that's true. We're told that we reap what we sow. So it's important to apply what's right and to reject what isn't. Now he's judging by appearance and this presupposition that Job's serious suffering can only indicate one thing. He must have sinned seriously against the Lord. Well, he goes on to say, as we read in verse 9, by the blast of God they perish, by the breath of his anger they are consumed. Now in chapter 4, verses 12 through 17, he claims some insight from a spirit, he says, visit that visited him. And, and I got to say, listen, not every spirit comes from God. Not every angel is, a, a, you know, a, a, right, a righteous angel, a, a, you know, faithful angel. There are fallen angels. Satan himself transforms himself, we're told, into an angel of light. And we're told not to be surprised that his ambassadors do the same. But listen how this guy describes his experience. He said, verse 12, chapter 4, a word was secretly brought to me. In my ear received a whisper of it. In disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones shake. And a spirit passed before my face. The hair on my body stood up. It stood still. I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker. Let me assure you that is not the voice of God. This is the enemy talking to him, knowing he's going to get on Job and say all these things. The other thing to log is that this is how cults start. I saw a spirit and the spirit told me things. And he said, no one else has it right, but I'm going to use you to straighten out the world. Listen. That's nonsense, because whenever uh, anyone comes, the prophets of old, saying, thus says the Lord, the test had to be 100% right 100% of the time. And so what's happening here is, is, is he's listening, but he's listening to the wrong voice. And so it's um, in the midst of all of it, you know, he actually has some good counsel. It's, it's amazing. He's like so confused about Job. He's confused about the circumstance he sees him in, but he still offers some good counsel for us, at least. It's chapter five. He says these three things to him. He says, seek the Lord, trust in his goodness, submit to his discipline. Let me say that's really good counsel. Seek the Lord, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever's happened to you or is happening to you, seek the Lord. Trust in his goodness. And then, well, submit to his discipline. We're glad you could join us today on this walk down the Calvary Road. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. 
You can visit our website at cc2co.com or download the CC2Co app to connect with us and to find more from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you. And until next time, may the Lord bless your walk down the Calvary Road. And your grace.